Turgeon reckons you can have your cake and eat it with this, the new 3008, which has its sights locked on Mercedes, BMW and Audi SUVs in this world. So let's see if it can take on those premium SUV offerings. For context, the E3008 is priced similarly to BMW's iX1 and iX2, Audi's Q4 e-tron and Mercedes's EQB. So it's got its work cut out. Now those three German marks are famed for their stylish cars. So the Peugeot lines come in with its claws out and produce this, one of the best looking cars in the class by a mile. Look at these headlights down here. Not only are they really cool in there, but also you've got these claw marks below. And then in the middle of the car, you'll spot this fake grille, admittedly, but one where the Peugeot badge is proudly exploding out from the middle. Imagine this thing coming up behind you on the motorway. I think Peugeot is quite proud of it. I think they want their owners to be proud of it as well. And it certainly has presence. Then if you come around to the side, you'll spot these wheels, which in themselves are a great mark of design. Ferrari might have something to say about this because, well, it looks a lot like the badges you get on the side of their supercars. And that's possibly not by accident, given Peugeot's ambitions with this car. Then if you come to the side, firstly, you'll spot how clean it is along here. And then we've got a slightly swoopy roof line here because this 3008 body shape you can get, they're not doing a swoopy roof line and then an upright one. To avoid it cutting into where the headline is, it actually doesn't angle down until after where your head goes. But we'll test that to show you how it looks in just a moment. Come around the back here and spot condensation in a rear light, oh dear. But the design itself is really very cool. Firstly, you've got these slats again, another reference to the claw, and they're in this bar across the rear, which if you squint a bit, looks a little bit like the rear light bar you get on a Lamborghini Urus. What do you think? And then if you look down below, you've also got these fog and reverse lights sort of look like they're trying to be exhaust pipes. So if you're looking at the back of the car, just at a glance, it looks like an Urus with two massive exhaust pipes either side. And again, I don't think that's by accident. And those lights being so low serve a functional purpose when it comes to parking. Also functional is this roof spoiler up here because it negates the need for a rear wiper on the window because it forces air through a narrow slat up there, down the window, clearing away the water and keeping the design nice and clean. And then there's the structure beneath the car, which Peugeot says is so strong that it can withstand an 80 ton impact into the side sills, meaning the battery in the floor is basically impenetrable. If it does need repairing, a mechanic needs to undo just 12 bolts to remove it, emphasizing how well engineered this platform is, something that's also clear inside the car because this has to be my favorite interior of this class. So let me tell you why. Now, Peugeot reckons this cabin is like a lounge. And I think they've done a really good job of achieving that, not least because of the lovely materials across the dash. The fit and finish is really very good. And even when you touch some of these softer materials here, it feels high quality and premium. And then you've got this new wave of Peugeot technology because this is based on a whole new base. And so it means you've got this wide infotainment screen up here and it's split into two halves. It's kind of the usual stuff you get these days. You've got your instrument cluster here with all your driving detail, and then you've got your proper infotainment screen here, but it is very nice to use. It's responsive and smartphone-like. And while Peugeot goes on about its amazing sat-nav system, which can help you charge your car en route, it crucially also gets Apple CarPlay and Android Auto wirelessly. You also get a wireless charging map, no shortage of storage space, and yes, okay, it's inherited Peugeot's smaller steering wheel, which some of you may know has benefits and negatives, but crucially in this car, it feels right. Okay, it still slightly blocks the view of the dash ahead of me, but nothing essential is blocked in my view. And now we've got these buttons up here, which might look capacitive at a glance, but rest assured they are proper buttons. They actually click because while they're a single piece, they rotate. So they're actually quite tactile to use. Same goes with the buttons down here and your drive mode selector. And you've even got a proper volume knob down there. So it means if you're rushing to stop your music playing too loud, you can turn it down. Although you probably want to have it quite loud because the focal sound system in this car is excellent. It's really, really very good. Oh yeah. And then the next feature I want to mention is there's a little screen down here to shortcut. You can customize it. So if you want to access some parts of the menus quicker, you can customize this just like you can on your smartphone screen. It's a really nice interior and it is actually quite comfortable. The seats are a bit firm for my liking. It's definitely on the sportier side, but they are definitely very supportive and they look really great. In fact, the whole cabin looks as great as the 3008's exterior. I love the dotted pattern on the dash, which resembles that of the grille on the nose. And generally, there's a bit more emotion and character to this cabin than that of those rivals. And in the back of the car, it is a very spacious affair. Firstly, I've got loads of space for my feet, even though this is set as low as I can go. And also there's plenty of knee room as well. And while the sunroof doesn't come all the way back to where I'm sat here, there is loads and loads of headroom above me. So I feel very comfortable in this seat. 
Plus, I've also got a lot of storage space in the door pocket as well. And that's where we've got our bottle here, which we filled with a sample that represents a minor spillage if you've got kids in the back. And look, the material in the back is actually drip resistant. Look, it actually just runs off the material, which means keeping this car clean, even if you've got kids spilling things in the back should be very easy indeed. If otherwise though, you've got people sitting across all three seats, well, handily, the middle seat is quite spacious. And if there's no one there, you can also lower this so that you've got an armrest with a couple of cup holders or even a full ski hatch. And you've also got a pair of USB-Cs and a pair of vents in the back. And as for the boot, if we open it here, it'll be interesting to see if you can hide away your charge cables. It looks like you can, but firstly, I can tell there is a lot of space in here and the floor is nice and low as well. There's a slight lip, but this adjustable floor gives you plenty of room. And I can demonstrate that with my travel on suitcase. This is the conventional size, the maximum you can take on a plane into where you sit and it fits easily. There's loads of space around it. Now, if I move that out of the way and I lift up this floor, you'll see that yes, there is plenty of space under there. Not only does it hide your charge cables, but you can get other bags and hide stuff away there. There's a lip here, but that is a very useful space. But if you prefer to have things on top, well, also this floor is adjustable. Not only can you have it at a slight angle like that, but you can also mount it so it is fully upright here and resting on those there, which is pretty good, very customizable. But shall we see if it actually lets you shut the boot in this configuration? Should do, yeah. I think that's done it. So not the biggest boot in the world, naturally, because you haven't got an upright part here, but given the shape of it, that's a very useful boot space. From behind the wheel, you can definitely tell that this is a Peugeot being engineered to chase those big German brands. It feels very refined. It feels solid on the road and wind and road noise as well are pretty low. So overall, it feels premium. There's ample performance on offer too from the car's front-mounted electric motor with 210 horsepower, giving it smooth, effortless performance albeit without ever feeling rapid. That trait will be safe for an upcoming dual motor model. It steers nicely as well. The small wheel ahead of me here does make it feel more naturally agile. When you turn the wheel, the car doesn't roll around like a conventional SUV. It's actually quite flat in corners, which makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're driving a sporty car, but that has come at a cost. And that cost is when you're driving over cracked roads, ridges and bumps, things like that, high frequency bumps and pothole ridden surfaces, it can be a bit tiring. So if you live in a city with a lot of those, this might not be the best car for you. It does improve on the motorway though, so much so that this car does feel quite at home on a cruise. It helps of course that the 3008 feels big and tough at speed. Funnily enough, it's exactly the same length as this Lincoln Co that we spotted during our drive. And since this 73 kilowatt hour battery car can do a claim 327 miles between charges, you can really press on. There will be a 98 kilowatt hour long range version capable of an estimated 435 miles later on, but with a 10 to 80% rapid charge time of under 30 minutes and a Tesla rivaling app that allows you to remotely control charging, as well as loads of other car features, even the standard E3008 is competitive. All right, so it turns out that this Peugeot E3008 can definitely take it to those premium marks, but we won't know for sure until we drive one in Britain in the next few weeks. But for now, if you need more inspiration when it comes to new SUVs, check out the ones up here.